Hi, and welcome to another edition of Interviews with the Masters. I'm your host, John Stallone. This week on the phone, we have IBO World Champion, ASA World Champion, Triple Crown winner, and an accomplished bow hunter, my good friend, none other than Tim the Hammer Gillingham. How you doing, Tim? Not too bad, John. How are you? Good, good. Can't complain. Just got back from hunting in California, Blacktail. We didn't get one, but uh, we had a good crack at it. Are their horns even grown all the way? Yeah. I actually found a pretty good one. Uh, yeah. We got on one that was probably 150-ish uh, the last last hour of the last day, of course. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Well, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about, you know, you know what you do in your organization? Yeah, well, I've been shooting archery and bow hunting for about 30 years, fairly religiously. I'm kind of known as a, a tinker. I've just always, you know, try and daily, you know, to try to understand better what I'm doing and understand, you know, my different archery and arrow setups and bow setups and, and just trying to perfect, you know, you know, you know, that art, you know, that yeah. helps with competition and hunting. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to get perfect, but, you know, I really enjoy that side of it. I really enjoy experimenting. So, uh, at Gold Tip, I've been here 12 years, uh, you know, had a lot to do with, you know, helping design the line and get the quality control in place. And my current job is I, I run, I'm a national shooting staff manager for Gold Tip. So I manage the national shooting staff, which is our kind of our ground level guys that are out, you know, working in shops, you know, influencing guys in, you know, you know, their local archery clubs. You know, we're just looking for, you know, that hometown hero, the guy that can really help us, you know, disseminate our message. And I work right. with them, which is kind of a, a function of sales and, try to generate sales, you know, through education and things like that. So, um, you know, I really enjoy teaching. Part of that, you know, what I do with our staff is really spend the time to educate them, and I'm kind of an open book. And, you know, if if people have, you know, questions, you know, I've really – we have a really good customer service team here at Gold Tip, and, I've, you know, they know a lot of what I know just because I've helped teach them through the – you know, you know, along the way as, you know, I've worked with them, so – I don't, you know, rat hole my information. So, absolutely, yeah. I've I've come to you many times for some for some tips and uh, and tricks on how to get my setup dialed in, and and you spent a lot of time with me so uh, through the years here, and uh, and I've always appreciated your your knowledge and expertise on on the subject matter. So, um, how did you get started? You know, st- uh, started in archery and in, and in hunting, basically. Well, in hunting, I mean, my family was a hunting family, and we, we hunted for food, really. I mean, I grew up, you know, gun hunting, per se, and I just really, it didn't it didn't sit well with me. And I mean, you're always shooting at animals and being run by, you, and it just mm-hmm. it was what I call quintessential hunting. You know, I've always hunted public land. I've never really, you know, done any guided hunts or anything like that. So, um, I always had just kind of a, a certain level of intrigue, you know, about... Um, you know, just the Indians in general and, and that, that lore, really. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's really what initially attracted me to it. So I remember we, I bought my first bow from a local preacher, and we just happened to have a really good uh, archery club in the town I grew up in, Rock Springs, Wyoming, and that kind of nurtured, you know, my a very always a very competitive person, too. So I you know, always felt like, you know, I like the athletic endeavor of it. And so I always, you know, it, it was just a good fit, and they had, you know, when I was 16, 17, I was running leagues five nights a week, so and yeah. I pretty much lived at the archery range. So it's, you know, I've learned everything pretty much by trial and error. You know, I listen to pretty much whatever, you know, I've been conditioned to, you know, and everybody else has over the years. And what I find is not, that you know, people's perception and even what people teach is not necessarily correct. So oh, yeah. you know, I've, had to, I've had to learn learn by failure pretty much. So, or, you know, I, I look at it as, you know, when I, you know, some of the guys give me a hard time because I'm always, you know, working a new angle or always changing my mind on a subject. But, you know, throughout <laughs> my archery career, I mean, I get clarity on certain things. What I thought was something else really turned out to be something altogether different. So, right, um, right. and it's just working to fine tune, you know, you know, you know, what I know 20 years ago is probably more than most people, you know, know today, so. Yeah, 
Um, how's yeah, most people's uh, outlook on archery and even especially hunting with archery equipment is just like, you know, it's something they do once a year and they don't pick up the bow until a couple weeks before season. You know, and that, and that works too. But uh, yeah. the guys that are, you know, consistently, you know, making it happen every year and, and well, are, are not those guys. <laughs> The guys that well, are doing it, stuff year round. A lot of it is just, yeah. A lot of it's just knowing your limitations. You know, if you're a guy like that, just know your limitations. I mean, I was watching a show last night on the Outdoor Channel, and and uh, this guy passes a monster 350 bull up at 60 yards, and I'm just like, what? Yeah, What's 60 guy, yards. You know, <laughs> he, he knew his limitations. You know, so I, I I look at my my own particular situation as I compete all the way up to the third week of August, and you know, so I miss a lot of times I'll miss the opener, but. I don't get, you know, I, I try to take it easy on my wife and not spend a ton of time in the field. So I try to mm-hmm. capitalize on the opportunities that I get, you know. So, you know, right. I really work hard on my equipment, my shooting, my confidence so that I can make virtually any shot that I get, whether it's a, you know, 20 degree shot at 75 yards or a, you know, or slam dunk or, or whatever. You know, I, I, I try to be ready for everything. Yeah. No, it's, it's important. I mean, just just on this last hunt now in California, I actually shot and missed. Um, I um, I shot at, at I ca- I couldn't get a solid range back because the grass was so high, and I kind of took an average of what I was getting and shot for 95 yards. Um, and you know most people were found at 95 yard shots, but I practiced out to 120 all day long. So, um, but he he must have been right about 90. And I was uh, I was using a nocturnal knock, and it was getting real dark at that point. And I think he actually saw it because he decided to drop, not when I shot, but right as the arrow was about to hit him, he dropped. Right. So I, he, I, mis, misjudging and, and, and shooting a little high, it just barely, like, almost clipped the top of his back. And, you know, and I ended up losing him. But... Uh, I end up not I, getting him is what I mean. I've never shot so. lighted knock too for that that specific reason. I've got some on right now, but I'm a little suspect of that myself. I mean, I've seen. I, you know what? I've never had the problem before. I guess it's just that long distance that he really watched the arrow come right at him the whole time. It was like he was staring right at me when I shot, and <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, that doesn't look natural. Let me duck, you know. But um, yeah, he didn't jump the string or anything like that, you know. He would have been long gone at 90 yards. It took two seconds for the hour to get over there, <laughs> you know. Right. But um, yeah, yeah. I know shorter shots, and if they're not aware, like I'm not looking in your direction, I, I've never had an issue with them at all. But that's the first time it ever, ever happened. It was crazy, actually. He ran about 50 yards, stopped, stood there for about 10 minutes, came back, and licked my arrow just to say F you, you know, <laughs> you missed. <laughs> but, well, you know, it's one of the things, you know, when I talk about setups and stuff that I really – I really talk a lot about is the sound of your arrow because I believe they hear the sound of your arrow, then they locate it by sight. And yeah, it's amazing how fast they can get out of the way. So, oh yeah, yeah. It just seems Absolutely. like even though you're shooting 320 foot a second, it's everything's in slow motion as soon as you touch it off. So, no, yep. I call it the matrix. They, yeah, <laughs> they get out of the way. Anyway, well, we had a bunch of questions on our Ask the Pro section that we compiled. You know, and we, you know, try to save them when we're going to talk a subject uh, with a professional in the industry. So uh, we got some some questions for you. Uh, the first one I got was, what can I do as a novice hunter to eliminate errors while in the field when it comes time to shoot? Um, basically, they want some rules to live by because when they shoot at a target at home, they can always hit the, you know, always hit the mark, but then in the field, they, they miss. Well, what, think, what are some things, you know, somebody I could do to prepare of, for one that? Of the, one of the most important things is, is similar to what I do with my wife, for example. My wife doesn't shoot a lot, so a lot of times I'll sight her bow in. She's a really good shot, but mm-hmm. I also put her on a movable sight. And the reason I put her on a movable sight is whenever I take her out and have her shoot split pins, her accuracy really suffers. And I think a beginner shooter, it might even be smart to put them on a single pin mover just because it slows them down. Um, mm-hmm. It slows them down and makes them aim where they want to hit rather than high or low. 
And I think one of the things that that uh, that, that it's just as, at any level, you know, one of the things that you can do in the field is really use what we use in tournament archery, and that's visualization. Okay, before you make the shot, program your mind. You know, my green pin's going to go right there. I'm going to hold, see the sight picture, see it fire. Okay, just a quick imprint in your brain is that that pin's going right there. Okay. Right. Because if you don't, a lot of times guys, I think, just get up, they they just fritz out and fire the shot and don't even know what happened. And so by programming your mind ahead of time to a, to a positive result, you have a better chance of actually achieving that positive result. You know, it's the mm-hmm. same thing if you guys talk about target panic when they're shooting their bows, they flinch in and things like that. Everybody's solution to that is mechanics. You know, shoot a, shoot a different release or shoot a back tension release, one that doesn't have a trigger. Now, that's a good solution, I believe, if you have it bad enough and you can't get rid of it. But the true fundamental right. problem is in your brain and your expectations. Okay, Your expectations are telling you, when I get in this situation, this is going to happen. Okay, It's just like a panic attack. In fact, that's mm-hmm. where I really learned this analogy is, is reading up some information on how to cure panic attacks. And because you replace that negative image with a positive image, you're gonna you're gonna start to expect that positive image rather than expect that negative image, and uh, you know you, you'll start to expect yourself to do good. I mean, I shot a deer last year on the Wasatch Front. And I practice all the time, like you said, out to 100, 120. Well, mm-hmm. when I got inside of, I think I ranged him at 84 yards, and to me, in my mind, when I seen that rangefinder, man, I said, "You're dead." I mean, in, in my mind, it's just there's not even a chance you're getting away. Right. You know, it, it, it was just such a slam dunk shot for me, and I think everybody needs to know their limitations there, and that comes from practice and and equipment. And I, I spend just an unmeasurable amount of time on on my equipment, oh, of course. Only, so that when I pull an arrow out of the quiver, it's not. I hope it hits there. I know it's going to hit there. Exactly. Exactly. I know one of the things that I've I've done in the past, especially like if I'm tree stand hunting. Because you have a lot of time to sit there and start visualizing. You start visualizing the deer coming up different directions and how you, you know, it's just like that, like you were saying, you know, to kind of eliminate yeah. that that surprise factor. It's a little different when you're spotting and stalking because you can't, obviously, you can't visualize where you're going to well, be. And, I mean, you can sure. on the hunt. Well, on the stalk, you can. Yeah. You but, know, and I think know. The, the best hunters I know are, are tournament shooters. Um, the best hunting shooters, let's say. And I think what it is is a lot of times when I shoot an animal, I honestly can't even tell you what kind of rack he had, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, it was just he's good enough, and then my mind goes straight to where I'm going to hit. And I think that comes from years of conditioning, you know, picking a spot on a 3D target. Yep. And, uh, you know, I don't think about anything else, but I'm going to hit that sucker right there, you know. So. Yeah. And, and if you know, if you spend enough time shooting turn archery, you know every every one of the pitfalls. Okay, there's so many shooters that come up here and they 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 take a rangefinder and they trust the manufacturer. And I always tell them people want right. to trust, trust, and verify. Verify, yeah. <laughs> because one thing I will tell our you know your readership as you get further and further out in distance, the cosine cut that rangefinders provide is not accurate. Okay. It is not. Well, it is not accurate. So. Well, that's a good. That kind of leads us into there's another question that we got here. So let me throw this out at you, and you can hit it with what you're about to say here. Uh, there are so many gadgets out there on the market. How can I gauge what's right for me? Is one of the questions we got. And so, you know, what would you suggest as far as the range finder is concerned? Well, you know, a lot of the range finders are adequate for 50 yard and in shooting. Okay. Mhm. But you know. Just be, you know, and, and I, I'm not going to put any brands out there. That just because, you know, I work in the industry. Yeah. You know, I worked for, you know, I a manufacturer, you. and I don't want to, you know, get myself in a position where, you know, I don't want to throw nobody under the bus per se. I hear you. <laughs> but I'm saying just do your do your homework. Um, and, but it also goes back to, and this is a thing that I deal with all the time here at Gold Tip. Um, is everybody thinks that because say heavy arrows penetrate better that super heavy arrows got to be way better but there's always right. a you know small diameters penetrate better well i typically tell guys there's four things in penetration really shot placements number one broadhead designs number two mm-hmm. you know arrow flights number three and then your diameter and weight come in fourth and fifth way down the list to me so 
most hunting situations you're dealing with ranging a shot. Say my rangefinder is off a little bit. Mm-hmm. What's the number one thing that's going to going to help me in that situation? It's going to be speed, right? Right. Okay. So every you know a lot of this is just perception. A lot of industry stuff is perception. It's it's marketing flair, marketing hype per se. Um, people can't figure out you know what to sell to somebody, so they sell them hype. And you know everything almost always comes back to that number one thing. You know, if I'm sitting in a tree stand and I'm and I'm shooting whitetails, for example, I'm dealing with a jumpy animal. I'm dealing with shooting through holes in the brush. I'm dealing mm-hmm. with yeah, I've ranged this trail, that trail, that spot, but I'm not 100% sure on the yardage. Well, speed's going to help you there. If you're shooting 300 yep. feet a second, it's going to be a whole lot better than if you picked up a 500 grain arrow that's shooting, you know, 240. Right. You know, and I think a lot of people have read some of the stuff that Ashby does and, uh, you know, with, you know, heavy, 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 super heavy FOCs and, and, and eight, 900 grain arrows is the only way you can penetrate anything. No. You ever try to hit anything with a recurve for the 900 grain arrow? No. (laughs) It's difficult past 15 yards. So you're kind of subject yourself to, you know, to that, you know, myself personally, I like a heavy arrow, but not for penetration because I know it performs better in the wind and the conditions and downrange at, at distance. And I choose to pull more poundage so that I can shoot the heavier arrow, but I Same still here. maintain a high velocity over 300 feet per second because I want to satisfy that first criteria. Right. Um, right. I pick my broadheads, you know, if you're only shooting 50 pounds, don't shoot a two inch, you know, Broad, right. you know, mechanical broadhead that has a real, you know, steep blade angle. That's not going to penetrate the best. You just use some logic no. there. Um, you know, if you're going to, you know, have plenty of, you know, energy, then you can do that. But don't be afraid to. I was watching Will Primos last night on TV. He shot, you know, I'm sure he's shooting plenty of energy, but he's shooting a Rage 40 KE. I've shot. Yeah. I mean, I've got a 33 inch draw length, 34 inch draw length, and I shoot the 40 KE Rage a lot of times. You know, on some things, just because, right. you know. It gives me better penetration. I got some of the NAP kill zones this year at a 1.75 because there's a happy medium in everything. Of course. You know, and yeah. and usually the extremes are not the, you know the best place you know to deal with. If I'm shooting antelope, maybe I go to a Rage Extreme 2.3 just because they're thin skin, they're easy to kill. You know, mm-hmm. but you know, an elk, yeah, I'd be punching. You know, it's probably better to take you know not even if you've got 80 plus foot pounds. Yep. So, there's just a happy medium no, I... in everything. So, you know, gimmicks, there's a lot of gimmicks, you know, just to get a reasonable sight. I'm a big, big fan of um, three and five pin movable sights. Um, Spot Hog yeah. probably make one of the. I so, felt like, yeah. So you uh, you're better off, you know, paying attention to that, and you're better off, you know, anything past 60, 70 yards. You're better off aiming exactly where you want. And I'm a really particular about how that bottom pin that I'm using when I move the sight looks like, because at further distances, if you've got a, you know, a 29 thou fiber that's glaring like crazy in the sun, because, you know, you, you're covering up the entire deer, so how are you going to aim accurately? Right. So you have to pay attention to those details, and, and that just comes from, you know, it comes from every night behind the house doing it, you know. You know, you just yeah. you learn that stuff by by practice. Absolutely. All right, I got another question here. We kind of touched on this a little bit in that first question, but basically the question is, when I'm home standing in front of a target 20, 40 yards, I can hit the bullseye every time. I have very tight groups. But when I'm hunting, I almost always miss. I don't think it's my nerves. I just never, it's just never the same in the field. And I guess we kind of talked about that visualization. Um, is there any other things that you can hit on that would, uh, you know, help somebody in that situation? 
Well, I mean, I think it's it's you know effective practice too. When I practice for 3D tournaments, if I go out and shoot targets at 40 yards standing, I'm not going to be a very good 3D shooter. Okay. Right. I have to put myself into the scenario that I that I see. And one of the guys that I see that does this really well is uh, Dan Evans from Trophy Taker. You see him post Facebook posts all the time. He's he's walking a target up in the hills. He's putting himself into position to take one shot, one kill. Randy Olmer's another guy that, you know, is, is really big on that. You know, walk out the door and make the first shot of the day and, and make it count. That's going to put you more, you know, practicing like you're hunting. You know, put right. your clothes on. Don't try to, you know, if you're going to shoot with clothes, make sure you got an arm guard and you, and you, you learn how to shoot with your clothes on. If it's going right. to be cold, don't just take a chance shooting with your glove when you never practice with your glove. Exactly. You know, confidence comes from practice, and practice, the most effective practice is perfect practice. So put yourself into that scenario. If you're a tree stand hunter, get up in your tree stand and shoot, or get up on the roof of your house. But, you know, you, you need to be able to, you know, put targets out there and make snap, you know, decisions. Um, everything just happens fast in the field. I mean, it, it's amazing. You'd think that, you know, you look at look at a 100-yard target at the house, and you're thinking, mm-hmm. I could sneak up on anything. They they won't know I'm there. But when you're 100 yards from an animal, it's like you're still in their danger zone. They know. They know yep. you're there half the time. So Absolutely. And, and, and it's just kind of like target panic. Okay, when you mm-hmm. get ner- or nerves in a tournament, the body's natural reaction is to speed up. Okay, its natural reaction is to speed up and get rid of that feeling. The one thing you should teach yourself in, in a hunting situation is slow down. Because if you'll tell yourself to slow down, you'll make calculated decisions and calculated shots. You know, I remember I had a 200-inch mule deer a few years back, and I had him at a pretty long shot. But because of all the knowledge I have on, you know, what one, you know, I know what one yard at that distance is, and it was enough to make a bad shot. So I'm sitting here looking at my cut chart, which is if it was a 15-degree slope, so I or a 12 degree slope and I was just my mind was just overwhelmed with all this stuff and I just didn't have the time so I didn't make the shot. A lot of guys would just put one in the air. Yeah. And maybe they'd hit it bad, put it, you know, maybe not, they'd have just shot what the rangefinder says. But because I've spent so much time behind the saddle, I know that that's not correct. Right. You know, I, I took my rangefinder out, set up a shot at 115 yards at a 25 degree slope and it was off 3 yards. So Right. I need time to to factor this stuff, and I'm trying to work on solutions for that in the field myself, so that I can make a quicker uh, assumption. Most of these these rangefinders, if you'll sight into the rangefinder and use the 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 cut feature, is pretty adequate out to 70 yards. Right. You know, if you're having I, I think, an error, you know, as long as you're shooting a fairly good velocity. Right. Right. And I, I I tell that to people all the time. I'm like, don't just go to the range, like a known range, and shoot at those yardages. Shoot with, you know, set your pins to your to your range finder. Not not to, you know, set your pins to what you're going to be using. You, you know, you're not going to oh, give yeah. you a take it. The deer is not going to stand there for you to run a tape to him and run it back to where you're standing. <laughs> okay, well, especially yeah, range finders, because you, know. you can pick up, yeah, you can pick up five different range finders and get five different readings. And if you understand that 70 yards, your bow is, your arrow is dropping Two and a half in, two to two and a half inches per yard, then right. you understand how bad, you know, a yard and a half error can be. Right. Yep. So, absolutely. You know, it, it doesn't. You know, if you're up close, and that's one of the reasons to get close, is it just lessens the chances you making a mistake. And I always try to get as close as I can. Um, but I also have learned over the years by blowing it that you take the first chance you think you can make. Right. Yeah. Again, another happy medium. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, you have but, to calculate. You know, you have to look at. You know, what's your experience? Can you shoot in the wind? I mean, wind is huge with arrows. So, oh yeah. You know, it, you have to calculate. You know, what's your odds? You know, if you make this shot. I mean, I was I killed one of my elk last year in 60 yards in a 25 mile an hour crosswind, and it was brutal, and it was a tough shot, and I got a little bit lucky, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, I'm a much bigger proponent of mechanical broadheads for that reason because they're so much easier to calculate what's going to happen. But right, compared yeah, to left surface system. area. So, well, um, I think I mean I, I'm going to add something to what we were just talking about as far as I basically I I, I agree with what you were saying as far as 
practicing. I, I always say practice for the game, basically. You know, if you're going to be in a tree stand, hook in the tree stand, and so on and so forth, spot stalk, practice from shooting from your knees, sitting down, you know, popping up from behind rocks or bushes or whatever, because all that stuff changes. And me and myself, I, I practice with my backpack on, with my binos, my range finder, everything that I'm going to be hunting with, my gloves. I mean, people look at me all the time. I'm wearing, you know, all the stuff at the range, and they're like, you know, what is this crazy man doing? But, mm-hmm. you know, anything that's going to order your, you know, alter your mechanics a little bit is going to well, you know, you know, make a, a big difference. So Yeah, I hunted with a heads-up decoy last year, for example, and, I mean, it's a really neat thing, too. You can get away with an awful lot. And I had the stabilizer mount. Okay. And and I shot it before I left. I mean, I should put it on my bow and shot it. Now, I didn't really necessarily want to shoot it that way. But, mm-hmm. you know, I want to see what would happen. You know, what kind of groups can I hold at 80 yards, 100 yards, you know, with this thing on the on the stabilizer. I ended up shooting my deer, one of my deer in Nebraska with that thing on my stabilizer just because I had the confidence that I knew it wasn't going to change anything. Right. Now, if it had been blowing 20 mile an hour, then that would have been like a sail. Yeah, sail. like a sail. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty dead calm, so it worked out pretty good. But you know, you just got yeah, you know, like you said, you have to you have to train for what you're doing. You know, if you're if it's going to be a dull sheep hunt, then you better practice slopes. You better practice shooting extreme shots. You know, you know if you're same thing with you know mountain goats or even elk hunting or mule deer hunting. I mean, you can you can get some extreme angles and you know things like that. Yep. So and you want to set your equipment up for the same thing. You know. Exactly. Not not every rig is what I every setup is designed yeah, for every I mean, situation. I'll give you an example of that is that when I hunt normally out west here, I, I don't even have a twenty yard pin. I go thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, and then I move my my mover off of the bottom pin. Right. When I go whitetail hunting on the other hand, I'll add a twenty yard pin to there because, you know, there's a good chance, you know, I want to be able to you know, if one comes in a tree stand I wanna to have to hold six inches low with a thirty yard pin. Yep. So that was the biggest thing, you know, being from out west. I had trouble tree stand hunting early on. I missed, I missed a couple of really, actually missed the biggest deer of my life because my my top pin was thirty, and I just didn't hold low enough, and I you know I shot right over his back, no. and you know you I made an adjustment have- actually. Now I now I keep a fifteen yard pin. Believe it or not, it's only at twenty yards. It's only a difference of one inch, but that right. that difference made made all the you know all the difference in the world to me from shooting from a tree stand. You just have so. to. That's just it. You have to get up on the roof and practice. I'm going to a tournament in in, uh, in Belgium here in about five weeks, and you know the calling card of these tournaments. It's a pro field event, and they 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 put that extreme stuff on you. So that's what I'm going to be practicing. I'm going to be practicing those real extreme shots. You know, and uh, yep. you know you got to know what your rangefinder does in those extreme shots too. It's it, if you coast, you know your uphill cuts are different than your downhill cuts. So, you know, it, it, your errors are going to be a lot different either way. So, you need to know you know what's going to happen, where you how you have to adjust based on what your rangefinder is telling you. Especially if you want to you know extend your extend your yardages out further. Absolutely. But again, go back to what you said earlier. If you don't have the time or whatever to do, just know what your limitations are and hunt within sure. them. And, and, and learn it. I mean, there's a lot of bow hunters out there, I think, even though they have movable sights, they're still penciling their marks in. Probably one of the greatest inventions ever for archery, in my opinion, is uh, the Archer's Advantage software program that allows you to print sight tapes. Um, right. It just saves you an immeasurable amount of time. I can... I can print off sight tapes, and when I, for example, when I, when I shoot in my backyard, I live at 4,500 feet in fairly dry air here in Utah. Mm -hmm. When I go to a tournament on, I was just up in Eugene, Oregon, or in Redding, California. When I go out there, I'm about, I have to run a sight tape that's different because at, say, my 20 to 100 yard gap is going to be. Oh, probably six inches off. But the beauty of a system like that is you just go out there, you shoot a 20, 100, put a sight tape on, and everything's dead on. Right. So, right. you know, if you know, you have to have that ability to do that, if, especially if you're wanting to extend your distances out. You know, 20, 30, out to 50 yards, I don't, you know, you're probably not going to see enough difference to shake a stick at. So, no, um, no. 
you know, you again be prepared for what you're. You know, I, I know so many guys that think they got a hundred yard pin, so they can shoot accurately at a hundred. Most of them can't hold a three foot group at a hundred yards. So. Right. But. Right. Well. Where can uh, where can our listeners find out more about you and, and Gold Tip and? Well, there's some. What do we you have do? Some bit, if you go to the Gold Tip Facebook or the, you know, we have stuff up on our Facebook page. We have uh, on our website. There's a YouTube link on the bottom of the page. Um, there's several videos that I've hosted there. Um, basic arrow stuff to start with. Eventually, we'll add some more tuning, high speed tuning videos. Um, if you just search me on YouTube, I'm sure you're going to find videos from Hamsky on sight leveling. That's another critical thing that you need to learn. Um, uh, you know, and Hamsky Archery Solutions sells some just some top notch stuff. Um, the website, like I said, the Gold Tip website, www.goldtip.com. There's some YouTube videos there that cover, you know, how to pick an arrow for 3D and hunting and different fletching patterns. And I go through how I take a set of arrows and cut them down. I mean, it's just like reloading ammunition. You're only as good as your ammo. Okay. Right. Um, if you run into problems, you know, tuning wise, uh, follow our selection charts. It shows how to use our selection charts on those videos also. And follow those religiously. One of the biggest things that I see hunters doing is getting, you know, they go to a bow shop and want a bow shop to tell them what, you know, what arrow spine they need to shoot. And a lot of them get, you know, get stuck in two week of arrows. Um, right. Make sure you read that information with the chart because, you know, a, a bow that shoots, you know, is capable of 290 foot a second and one that's capable of 350 or three, two different animals and they require different arrows. So Absolutely. you really can't be too stiff, but I see a lot of problems when guys get too weak. Mm -hmm. uh, you start losing your arrow-to-arrow -arrow accuracy, and that will really show up when you go to fixed blades and start pushing, you know, more speed. So there's there's lots of stuff there. Um, like I said, there's a lot of videos out on YouTube. If you just, you know, search, you know, Tim Gillingham, I mean, I think you'll find lots of stuff out there. Um, but don't be afraid to call me at Gold Tip here or any of other customer service guys. I mean, you know, they are pretty knowledgeable on, you know, arrow-related stuff and, and stabilizer-related stuff. I think stabilizer is another area that you can really help yourself quite a bit, you know, as mm -hmm. an amateur-level shooter. That will help you at the moment of truth. You know, it might be worth packing a little bit more length and weight on your stabilizer if it helps you at the moment of truth. So Right, right. Um, especially guys with a tree stand. I always tell guys, if you run up a tree stand, I would pack a heavy bow. Because ain't one thing going to help you when you're nervous, and that's that's weight. You know, when I'm nervous right. in the tournament situation, I want a heavy bow. I want lots of weight on the end of my stabilizer because it slows down that. It's just like a guy walking a tight wire, you know. Mm -hmm. he got weight, he's got weight down there and the wind blows. He's not going to feel it as much in the middle. So, exactly. Um, you know, so there's, there's there's lots of information out there. And look look for us to do more and more, um, you know, throughout the years, you know, I I've got some stuff up on Hoyt's website, you know, tips and tricks stuff there. Uh, I think most of it's target related, but uh, I now shoot for PSC, and we're actually headed down to the PSC factory here on the on the 28th or 29th to do some filming. So nice. Um, so. Nice. Well, you should look me up when you get here. I'm gonna take you uh, take you guys out. We we'll do a little prayer call. Yeah, I'm only down there for the day. I got. <laughs> you no, know, I really am coming in in the morning and leaving in the afternoon, so this time ain't gonna work. So that would be fun. All right, Tim. Any other final words of wisdom before I uh, let you go? Well, just practice and never pull an arrow out of your quiver that uh, you haven't tested in practice. I mean, that is probably my biggest piece of advice. You know, all arrows are not created equal, and and uh, you got to make sure you do all the homework and you know shoot your broadheads. Even if you're a mechanical broadhead shooter, shoot the mechanical broadhead. Don't trust the practice point the manufacturer sends. A lot of them don't shoot the same, especially as you get out further. Uh, mm -hmm. I always take a little super glue and glue mine shut just, just to make sure I'm getting the same exact airflow over the broadhead and I'm getting the same drag effect. Um, those are really critical uh, things, and, and, you know, make sure... You learn how to spin test a broadhead. There's there's some good stuff on our Aero University part of our website that teaches you how to spin test broadheads. That's really critical that everything runs concentric. The faster you go, like with crossbows, the more critical the con concentricity is. So right. 
you know, just learn, you know, you know, try to learn something, you know, every week, you know, there's tons of information on the internet and on Facebook and on, you know, and don't be afraid to ask the top guys, you know, if, if he's a top level competitive shooter, chances are he's a top level bow hunter too. Um, right. A lot of the guys I compete with routinely kill big animals. You know, they may not have the TV shows, but, uh, you know, they're definitely, you know, they, they use the same mentality hunting that they do when they're, you know, training for, you know, for competition. Right. Well, I thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure our listeners will will pull some wisdom out of this uh, this interview. And uh, I hope to see you soon. And uh, good luck to you and the rest of your uh, your season this year for well, for archery competition and and the upcoming hunting season. My wife's got a mountain goat tag. That's going to be the highlight of my season. Well, there you go. So, and uh, I'm doing a little Kodiak sick blacktail hunt this year, which I'm really looking forward to. So, awesome. Uh, got That's me great. some new sick gear, and I'm ready to roll. So, <laughs> there you go. But, All right, very good. Thanks, Tim, and we appreciate All right, it. All right, I appreciate it, John. Have a good day. You too. Well, folks, there you have it. That's uh, Tim the Hammer, Gillingham. And uh, that concludes our interviews with the Masters. Until next time, I'm John Stallone. Thank you.